Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep His promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another in acts of love and good works. And here we go. And let us not neglect our meeting together. Now, some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. Let us not neglect our meeting together. One translation says, do not forsake the assembly of believers. What is, what is it saying here in Hebrews chapter 10? It's saying that meeting together is an important part of who we are as followers of Jesus and His church. Well, this is quite a dilemma, isn't it? Because right now we're in the middle of a very unique time in our society, in our nation, in our world. If you're joining us for the second time in our first ever church kind of online experiment, my name is Justice. I'm the lead pastor of Freedom Church, and we are gathered all over the multiverse. <laughs> we have people meeting in homes and, and, and uh, meeting on the other side of their iPhone and, and, and who knows where. So we are in a series called Unshakable. Five pillars to live a life that is unshakable. And last week we talked about how worship is the primary pillar on the foundation of Jesus that holds our life together. But today we got to talk about pillar number two, and that is godly community. What does it look like for you to have godly community? And how important is it to talk about this pillar right now when we all feel so isolated? Like, I, I, I can't even imagine what your life is like right now and how alone possibly, possibly you may feel. But I can tell you this, no matter how holy you are, no matter how, you know, close to God you are, that doesn't mean you can necessarily escape that feeling of isolation. Or maybe you've ever felt like you're around a lot of people, but never felt more lonely at the same time. You know, I remember years ago when I first gave my life to Jesus, um, I think I was 20, uh, just about to be, I was almost 21 when I gave my life to Jesus. I was 20. And my whole family lived in Texas. I was the only family member that lived here in, in Southern California. And so my, my real community around me were my friends. They weren't necessarily like my family. My family was still my family. But I had that support system around me and those good friends that were journeying with me and hanging out. And do, I had all that even before I was a Christian because everybody finds themselves in some, you, you know, you need a support system around you. Isolation will kill you. And God called me to go to Bible college. I gave my life to Jesus and, and I went straight to, to Bible college. And I remember pulling up onto that campus and, and not knowing a soul. I'd never been on that campus. I didn't know a single person there. I was moving into the dorms. I didn't even know who my roommate was going to be. And it was like so many people around me, like dorm life. Like there was four different rooms connected to each other. And there was, we all shared a bathroom. I mean, we were in close proximity together, but I might as well have been living on Mars by myself. I was so alone. I was so alone. And at a time when I was closest to Jesus, I never felt more alone. Think about that for a second. You can live a life that does all the right things, behaves all the ways that you read in this scripture, make all the godly choices that you can think of. You could memorize this thing six ways till Sunday. You could drop every four letter word out of your vocabulary. You can only watch cartoons and PG movies and on Pixar and Disney and still feel, feel by yourself because it's not about what you're doing, it's about who you're around. So the pillar number one is that you worship is actually gonna help you live an unshakable life, the life God has for you. But pillar number two is godly community. That to do life by yourself, that's gonna shake you up. It's gonna get you in your head. There's a difference between isolation and solitude. There's times to be by yourself, seeking God, just you in your mind and the Lord and worship and see, you know, there's, there's times for the spiritual discipline of solitude, but that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about if you're hearing my voice and you feel by yourself because you're trapped at home, right? And you've never spent more time with your spouse or you've never spent more time with your roommates or you never had more time with your kids, right? But you're feeling by yourself. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 16 if you have a copy of the scriptures with you. You can use your phone, you can use the Bible, you can use your browser if you're 
But in Acts chapter 16, I want to read a story about these two renegades, okay? Paul and Silas. And they were mavericks, man. These guys were rogues. Like they, they, they were going into these cities. They were leading people to Christ. They were doing miracles. They were, they were tearing it up because of what they're doing. And they begin to be persecuted. It says in chapter 16, verse 22, a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas. They weren't doing the wrong thing. They were doing the right thing. But the, world, the, 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 the city responds. And the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into a prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. So these guys are captured, uh, they're beaten, they're stripped naked, they're beat with rods, right? And then they're thrown not just in the dungeon, but they're thrown in the, the, the inner dungeon. Not just like the normal jail cells, but the bottom of the dungeon, the deepest, darkest, most lonely place in the whole entire jail construct. They're down there by themselves. They have a personal guard right up the, you know, right up the stairway there. He's not hanging out with them, but he's, he's keeping an eye on them, who is most likely a retired you know, centurion who had crucified people and led hundreds of soldiers. This guy was a retired B.A., BA stands for bad attitude, okay? He's a retired BA, and his job is literally to make their life easier? No, it's to make their life worse, right? So they're down there in the bottom of the dungeon, right? Somebody open a window. Wait a minute, there is no windows. Wait a minute, we can't reach the window because our hands and our feet are stretched out in these giant wooden handcuffs, which, why did they put their hands in there? Is, why did they put their feet in there? Why did they stretch them out like that in those wooden handcuffs? Is it because they were afraid that they were going to escape, and so they put these wooden handcuffs? No, they would have had chains around them. Those wooden stocks were to torture them. They're in the dungeon. They're by themselves. He's guarding them, right? He's, he, they, 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 they're in a torture device, okay? And it just couldn't be getting any worse than that. And this is what happens next. At around midnight, it says, that Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What? What are you? Around midnight, Paul and Silas were crying and whining and blubbering and hating God. That's what I would think any normal person would be doing in a dungeon in these kind of circumstances. No. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. Okay, maybe that part I can believe. And singing hymns to God. Can I just talk for a second about singing hymns? I don't know the last time you sang a hymn, but you know how hard it is to even just sing a hymn, period, right? Like, I'm not a singer. It's not my spiritual gift. I don't like to sing very much, but I do it for one reason and one reason only. Because I'm grateful for what God has done for me, right? I'm not a singer. Like, you're not going to, like, catch some sort of secret iPhone recording of me in the shower singing you know, Lady Gaga, okay? I'm not, I, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't, it's not my natural disposition to like just break out in song. That's not me. The only time I sing is when I'm grateful. It is hard to sing hymns and be bitter at the same time. It's hard to worship and be ungrateful at the same time. It's hard to blame God and sing at the same time. That's why singing is so important. You know, we're talking about worship and godly community and and when you sing, that is an expression of something that God has done, you know? God has done something in your life, and so you have to respond with the, the instrument God has given you. And here's some guys who found a reason, despite all these circumstances, to worship God. They have a grateful heart, a grateful spirit. And check this out. The other prisoners were listening to them. Okay? So they're at the dungeon. Their, 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 their songs are echoing up throughout the chambers. There's other layers, levels, where prisoners are listening. And suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. I don't know if it gets any scarier than being in a dungeon and then an earthquake happens. Because when you're in a dungeon, in the inner cell, and an earthquake happens, you're usually the one that gets collapsed on. Like that's the most unsafe place. It's the most dangerous place there is. So just picture this for a second. Here's two guys. They love Jesus, they're starting churches, 
and they get captured and they get beaten and they get flogged and they get tortured and they get thrown into a dungeon and instead of responding in all of the ways that we would normally assume any normal rational person in the natural would respond, they respond in the supernatural. They're worshiping and they're singing. Here's my question to you. Here's my question to you. Remember, what we're talking about today is godly community. Do you think they would have responded this way, either Paul or either Silas, if they would have been by themselves? Do you think if it had just been Paul down there in the dungeon, hands in the handcuffs, being beaten, all that, do you think that guy would have had the strength to sing worship to God by himself? Do you think Silas, do you think he would have been, you think he would have just dug down deep and just started singing? And, and, and you think he could have convinced himself to stay grateful and keep the right mindset during that time? I, mean, I think you probably know exactly where I'm going with this sermon today. I want to give you three reasons why godly community is an absolute game changer for you. Godly community, though right now we're trying to figure this out as a church, we have to figure it out. Come on, we have to make church happen. Because number one, godly community gives you strength. The word communion is, a, is really a combination of two words. It means common union, right? When I talk about godly communion or godly community, I'm talking about your relationship with God and your relationship with others. And I hear so often, and maybe this is you, and if this convicts you, I'm sorry, but I'm not. I hear all the time people say, you know what, this is just my church over here. I just do this podcast, and you know, my church is, I just go hiking. It's just me and the creator, and I go hiking, and it's just me, and it's like, the, you know, it's like, oh, it's like, oh, I can feel him, and I just like, dude, that's not biblical. God is always driving you, not only to a relationship with him, but a relationship with others. You can have your solitude time. That's important. That sounds like it really feeds your soul, and it's good for you, and you know how to nour nourish things that are, you know, the way God designed you. But it's also a trap to just be a selfish Christian who only just, you know, it's just you and God, you and God, you and God, you and God. Man, to truly be in communion with God is to be in community with others. You want to live an unshakable life? You're going to have to have the right people in your life. Because true godly community brings you strength. Paul had Silas, and Silas had Paul. Remember the story earlier when I was talking about how I was in Bible college and I was by myself? I'd never felt more alone, even though I was never, had never been more close to God. But I remember at the time, my girlfriend, just this foxy young lady by the name of Maria Oliva. Spoiler alert, she turns out to be Maria Coleman. Uh, but she, she knew that I was dying, man. She knew I didn't have the friends in my life that I, was, that, 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 that I, I usually had around me. And she surprised me on my birthday. She went, drove an hour away, picked up one of my friends, my closest friend, and drove him an hour back. And then I'm walking across the, the courtyard of school. And you know, like I said, you know, I had peace. I was good. I was in a good place, but I was very alone. And suddenly, my best friend jumps out from behind the bushes and, and like, justice. And I'm like, what the heck? And I was reliving this story with my, my wife recently. And she goes, there was such a just dramatic change in you. She's like, you just had so much joy. Even though it was for two hours, it was like life was just like poured into you, you know, your soul. You know, that's how she described it. And, and she goes, I remember I drove one hour there and one hour back so you could spend time with him for two hours and then drive another hour there and another hour back. She goes, it was four hours of driving so you could have two hours with your friend, but it was worth it. Do you have a friend like that in your life? Do you have somebody in your life that just gives you strength? Did you, do you know they're a gift from God? Do you know God has given you people in your life to bring you strength? That's godly community, right? This is why we have small groups in our church. We call them life groups. They meet for a semester at a time. That's why we come together, you know, on Sundays and we have different services where everyone like sits next to each other and saves a seat for their friend and all that kind of stuff because you're not meant to follow Jesus by yourself. I'll say it this way. You were never designed to be strong enough by yourself. You're never designed to carry things by yourself. Now, yes, you have Jesus who is your savior and he is your strength, but one of the best ways God gives you strength is to give you the relationships in your life to help make you strong. Pillar number two in an unshakable life is godly community because godly community magnifies your worship. 
Godly community takes worship and magnifies it. Like if you just worship God by yourself, that's, that's singing, that's worship. But the moment you start adding other voices, other hearts, the gratefulness increases. The praise begins to resound louder and louder. You go from just being a solo act to a choir. Can you imagine Paul at the bottom by himself? His hands are in the, his hands are in the stock. His feet are in the stock, right? And he's like, just by himself, your heart is what I want to know more of. By himself, no Silas, just Paul. How annoying would that be? Like you're a prisoner in one of the other chambers. You're like, knock it off. Stop singing. Like it would be annoying to hear one lone dude just singing, right? But the moment the second voice joins, the moment the other dude joins in and starts singing, now it's not some dude who's had his brains beaten out by a centurion. Now it's two people. It's not a crazy guy down there. Maybe something's happening. Suddenly there's a strength that's felt in the song. Suddenly there's a hope that's beginning to rise up in the, from the dungeon depths, right? Suddenly faith, it's two people. Faith is being, you know, it's being stirred up. You, you feel it and it's not annoying. It's actually inspiring to everybody. And look at what happens next. As their worship is magnified, it says, suddenly, verse 26, there was a massive earthquake. Suddenly, on the other side of their worship, in godly community, there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the prison doors immediately flew open and the chains off every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open and he assumed the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself. We're all still here. We're all here. We're everybody. All the chains fell off. Every prisoner, every door was open. Everybody had the chance to run. Everybody could have, but they didn't. Because the godly community, the worship, the unshaken faith of those two guys in that dungeon Sounds like it was scarier than the earthquake itself. Paul shouted, stop, don't kill yourself. The guy has the, the sword and he has the butt of the sword on the ground. He's like, man, I'm gonna dive on this sword and kill myself because at any moment, I, you know, if, I, if, if my supervisors find out that I let some prisoners get escape, they're gonna kill me anyway. So I might as well kill my, myself. Paul and Silas go, stop, we're all still here. In fact, everybody's still here. The jailer called for the lights, ran to the dungeon, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and he asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. That's a promise. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in their household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer, check this out, cared for them and he washed their wounds. Look at how dramatically everything has changed now. I mean, the, the, the whole thing is the guy who was beating them and torturing them is now caring for them as a result of their unshaken faith. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. This is the middle of the night. He and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Now, I don't care if you're by yourself right now. That deserves a clap. That's an amazing story. <laughs> Paul and Silas... They knew that worship was a pillar to an unshakable life, but they also knew that godly community would be a game changer because now their godly community didn't just give them strength, but godly community was magnifying their worship. And you know what else godly community does? Point number three, it aligns our perspective. It, it, it puts us in the right mindset. These guys experience an earthquake from God that was delivered from the heavens and ordered to break them out of jail as a rescue attempt, but they are so unshaken that instead of running away, they align their perspective with God and they say, I may be running away from the jail cells, but I'd also be running away from this jailer. So let's just stop and make sure he has an opportunity to know Jesus 
and know the hope and know why we're so unshaken by all this and how we can worship and how we can have this kind of strength. And this Philippian jailer is blown away along with everybody else in the whole place. Here's the wildest part. They go back to the jail cell the next day. They go back to the dungeon voluntarily, right? So this guy doesn't lose his head. And then later, you know, they're set free. But the earthquake, the earthquake was never about setting them free. It was about setting the jailer free. And the godly community that Paul and Silas had, they gave them the perspective that they needed. Let's contextualize this for a second, because maybe you're like, Justice, I'm with you. I feel like I'm in a dungeon right now. My kids are home from school. I've never spent so much time with my spouse. My kids are watching YouTube until their brains fall out of their head, and I'm going crazy, right? Look, we're all in this together. We're gonna make church happen. We're gonna stand on the foundation of Jesus, and we're gonna make sure that every pillar is lined up. I wanna encourage you to continue in this series over the next few weeks. And I want to give you an application for this very week so you don't have to wait till next Sunday for church online. We are forming online Bible studies. My goal is to have enough online Bible studies this week at different times during the day. Maybe the morning works well for you. Maybe the evening works well for you. Maybe you're looking for a guys group or a girls group or a marriage group. Maybe you're looking to grow in your faith and you need to join our growth track class. We are putting together a custom online Bible study, we've never done this before, that's gonna be facilitated through Zoom. I don't know if you've ever used Zoom before, but Zoom is a, an online platform where you can actually have community around your device where you can watch the Bible study and that, we're gonna, that, we're, that we're in the process of creating. It's on the book of Acts. It's called Unshakable Hope. That's the first part. And you can watch that together. You can discuss the scriptures and you can have, you can have godly community. Look, we can't gather on Sundays, but we're finding a way. We're making a way because we believe it's a pillar to an unshakable life. And so I want to encourage you. I want to inspire you. I want to motivate you. I want to challenge you. I want to dare you. I want to double dog dare you. I want to pastor you. I want to prod you. I want to spur you on. Like it says, whatever you read in Hebrews chapter 10, spur one another on, right? For this is your chance. Jump into one of these groups. Give it a shot. It's going to be three weeks in a row. Once you get in one of these groups, you're going to have a leader, you're going to have a Bible study, and you're going to have the godly community that you're looking for during this time so that you will no longer just be worshiping by yourself, but you'll be worshiping in godly community. Godly community gives you strength. Godly community magnifies your worship, and godly community aligns your perspective. I'll end with this story. You know, a few years ago, my wife and I went through a pretty scary time. Um, it was a really rainy day and she was driving our minivan at the time. Uh, we have three small kids. Two of them were in car seats and one was a, in a bumper seat or a booster seat. And um, I got a phone call while I was at lunch with somebody. And it was actually my little sister, my, my wife's little sister. And as I pick up the phone, um, she's crying. And she says, Maria and I were on the phone and suddenly she started screaming. And I can't get a hold of her and I think she was in a car accident. And so, of course, my heart drops out of my chest. Of course, you know, like anybody else, all the darkest thoughts are going through my mind. Fear is right in my face. And then I said, do you know where she was on the freeway? And she goes, yeah, I know where she was and um, at the time of the call. So I, I run out, I jump in my car and I'm doing the same thing you do, I, I'm driving 90 miles an hour as fast as I can, blowing through yellow lights and red lights. I get to the freeway, I jump on, I'm driving in the shoulder. And as I'm driving to where the last place that phone call went off, I, I'm thinking, I'm gonna pull up and find my wife's minivan upside down and my family. You know, I, I, that's what I'm thinking in my head. My phone rings while I'm driving like a, like a madman and it's a phone number that I don't recognize. So I pick it up and there's a lady and she's crying. And she says, I'm, I'm here with your wife. And I said, put her on the phone. And I hear my wife's voice. She says, hi babe, I'm okay. When she said, I'm okay, I'm, it wasn't the sound of someone who was in shock 
or who was numb, or even just somebody who was relieved that they were alive. She said, hi babe, with the sound of the peace of God in her, in her heart, her reality. She said, yeah, the car rolled multiple times on the freeway. She had wind up hydroplaning, driving up the side of this, this rock face basically and flipping over. And then when I pulled up on the scene and I saw my car looking like a micro machine on the shoulder, I went straight into the ambulance. And even though I'd heard my, my, my wife's voice, I still couldn't believe it. And, and uh, there she was and she was okay. And I was looking down at her and holding her and she was in her right mind, she was, you know, she was at peace. She'd obviously gone through a lot of trauma. But then I look up and I see my nephew at the door of the ambulance. I don't even know how he got there. And I was in shock at first. I was like, what's this guy doing here? And he just knew to come straight to the scene. He just knew that that's what family does. When, you're, when, when something goes down, your family shows up at the door. And, and then when I got to the hospital, we had more good friends. We had Vanessa there and Richard there. Is there anything that you need? And they were taking care of the thing. By the time we got home, we had food that was ready so dinner was taken care of that night. Man, I got good friends because I have a good God. And guess what? There are people in your life that God has put for you to have godly community. There is nobody who is following Jesus that God is going to leave by yourself. I would just pray that we open our eyes today, the people that God has put in your life. Join one of these small groups. Join one of these online Bible studies. Let's open our eyes to the people that God is positioning. God will never leave you alone. He'll never leave you without godly community. He hasn't designed you to be strong enough by yourself. He wants worship to be magnified, and He needs you to have a proper perspective for His kingdom purpose and the purpose that's attached to your life and His plan for this world. You know, the next day we got a really interesting phone call. Um, uh, the lady who called me, her name was Nora, she, she, she called Maria's phone again. And, and, and Maria wasn't answering her phone because she was recovering and so I picked it up and, and she said, hi, this is Nora. And I don't know if you remember talking to me, but I said, Nora, you're the one who called me to tell me my wife was okay. You're the one that helped get her out of the car because the door was pinned shut. Like, Nora, we call you our freeway angel. We love you so much. Thank you for calling us back. And, she was laughing, but I could also hear that she was kind of crying. And this, this is 24 hours after the, the car accident. And I said, well, what's going on? Why are you so shaken? And she said, do you think when your wife recovers that she'd be open to maybe just having coffee with me or maybe just a phone call? Those are almost her words, verbatim. And I said, I'm sure she would love to get together with you. And she says, I just got to ask her some questions. Because here I am and I'm still shaken up. I'm still a mess. But the strength that she had that day and the peace that she had that day has just left me with more questions. And to make the story shorter, my wife did wind up meeting with Nora. And she described sitting down with her at Starbucks. And this lady just breaking into tears the moment they sat down. And it turns out that even in the most devastating and violent and scary moment of Maria's life, she was able to just have a level of peace and strength in a shaky world that demanded an explanation for her faith. And Nora had to know more to make the story just a little bit shorter, Nora wound up coming to church in the following weeks and giving her life to Jesus. I share that story because when we're in a dungeon, when we're in a tough time, when we're isolated, we don't have the, you know, these are the times when we don't always, we can't always trust our, we're not thinking straight. And you being in godly community is a big deal, not just because you need strength, and not just because God needs to be worshiped and deserves to be worshiped, but because your perspective we don't, it might, your perspective might be shaky. Your, your perspective on how things are might be, might be misaligned. It might not be lined up with what God's really doing in your life. Because I can promise you this, God's not left you by yourself. You're not alone. 
you have him and you have the right people in your life. God's at work, he's on your side, and there are things in motion that he's doing in your life right now. But you could miss it simply because you do not have godly community around you helping align your perspective with what he's doing. You know, somehow, that crazy incident where our minivan flips three times and, oh, by the way, my kids were not in the car, by the grace of God. I didn't tell that part, so my kids were okay. The car flips, my wife goes through all that. Somehow, God uses something terrible to become something good. Wouldn't that just be God's plan all along? Here we are in the middle of the coronavirus, COVID-19, so many people flipping out and so many things. It feels like the, the you know, world's going to hell in a handbasket. And yet the church rises up and delivers a crystal clear course for everyone to follow, a foundation for them to stand, and unshakable examples of God's love during this time. Yeah, your perspective is important, not just for you, but for the, all the other prisoners and all the other jail cells who's looking into your dungeon and watching you worship God in godly community. Can I pray for you? Would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes? Lord, we thank you so much for the technology that's brought us together. What a gift. But Lord, I pray that anybody on the other side of my voice right now, whether they're just on a device by themselves or whether they're maybe with a group of friends or they're catching this on YouTube or whatever it is, we know you're the God over time and over all situations. I pray right now you'd speak to their heart. I pray you'd help them understand that without you, they're always going to feel shaky. Without proper worship, they're never going to know that they were made in your image and that they belong to you. Without godly community, they're never going to have the strength that they need for the life you've called them to live. Lord, I pray that right now that my voice would speak to those hearts, but it would be your word that says, for God so loves the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, for you. He gave his only son, Jesus, the most precious thing possible, the love of the Father, for you, so that you could know him, so you could be forgiven of all the things that you've ever done wrong, and if you're like me, that's a lot. All the things that you would ever do in the future that would be wrong, if you're like me, my life would be a mess without God. And that you would be able to know this love because of Jesus. My prayer is that you would receive the forgiveness of God today made possible through Him, and that you would surrender your life to Jesus. You would say yes to this love, so that you would know this strength and you can live a truly unshakable life. If that's you and you want to make that decision today and you're watching live online right now, my encouragement would be that you would simply just type in that chat box, I believe, I believe. Just have the courage to right now just type that in the chat box. We have a prayer tab if you need prayer. We have online hosts that are going to be moderating this but we want to send you some free resources, give you everything that you need. So like I said, you're not trying to follow Jesus by yourself. And if you're already a Christian, you're already a part of our community of faith, you need a next step today because church is looking differently right now. The landscape of church is changing. And my encouragement, like I said, my, 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 my challenge would be you join one of our online groups that are starting this week. And so for the next three weeks in a row, you'll have a godly community in your life and you can experience an unshakable life. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you next week.